Greetings, everyone. Dr. Brian Scott with you. Welcome to this uh, week of our Insight to the End Times podcast. We are in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We have been for a couple of weeks now. Let me read the opening verses before we get into our discussion today. Paul is writing the young pastor Timothy, and he says, Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. That word perilous means extremely dangerous times. Verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. I'm reading from the New King James. The King James is very similar. And Paul introduces this chapter by saying, in the last days, this is the very last days of the uh, existence of life on earth as we know it today. Because when we get to the very end of this time frame, that's what we're examining in Insights. We'll head into seven years of tribulation on this earth, followed by the Battle of Armageddon, when the Antichrist and all his followers will be completely destroyed. And then that ushers in the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, called the Millennial Reign of Christ. We're getting closer and closer and closer to that occurring. And when you consider that the church age began with uh, Acts chapter 2, or it began in Acts chapter 2, just after Jesus went to heaven, following his death, burial, and resurrection, that's when the Holy Spirit was given to the church in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and the New Testament church period began. It's called the church age. It's approximately a 2,000-year period. So if we just do simple math... It began in 30 A.D., and uh, as according to most of the historians, 2,000 years would make the total period 2030. We're in 2024. So, yes, we're getting closer to the end. We don't know exactly when, and we're not allowed to know exactly when. But we are allowed to see all the signs that are occurring. And Paul lists about 25 different signs of extremely dangerous events occurring on the earth in the very last of the last days. We're examining them one by one. As we start this week, we're in the middle of August. I almost said April. We're in the middle of August, and uh, we are on uh, the um, eight, ninth major sign, referred to in chapter th uh, 3, of course. Verse number 3, the very first sign there is unloving. The King James says, without natural affection. So let's examine that in some detail today. I believe, if I recall correctly, we did start looking at it last Friday. So here we are, Monday, August the 19th. Let's get into it. Uh, without natural affection is the very opposite of the word loving. So here we are studying unloving. The word loving comes from the Greek word storge, and it means love, devotion, and commitment to one's family. That's what the family unit has always been about. Love, commitment, and devotion to your family. When you take this word storge and add an A to the front of it, so it becomes a, a storge or a storgos, then you get the opposite meaning. It's a, a very incredible how adding this one letter A changes the meaning 180 degrees. So here's what it means. A lack of devotion to your family an absence of commitment to your family, the deterioration of family relationships, the loss of family affection, the breakdown of the family. Well, uh, we are, we're in that second, we're in on, on, we are in a period of unloving, having swept across the nation far more than people realize. Um, it, counselors and school teachers, for instance, will confirm that the family unit, the home unit, and the children are all under a major attack. Things are crumbling. They're deteriorating. And every time 
things start to fall apart, what do you see happening? The government steps in with a program to fix it. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but most government programs create more problems than solve problems. At least here in our country, it seems to be the case. So when we look at the average family today, we're not looking at the average family that I grew up in. Uh, no way. We're looking at a family that is completely the opposite. Now, when I was in public school, that's the first eight, you know, grade one to grade eight. That's a long time ago for me. But when I was in public school, uh, my friends all came from two parent families. I don't even remember a one parent family. I can't even think about a one parent family from my school, early school, school days. <clears throat> and uh, kids played together. Family kids played together. And we had a good time. We had a great time. And um, <clears throat> there was a, a cohesion in the family. Uh, in most of those instances, the whole family went to church together on a Sunday, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a rarity today. We have more single parent homes today than we've ever had in the past. And most kids uh, today are, um, can I say it this way? They're out of control. Why do I say that? Well, when you give a six-year-old a cell phone, a smartphone, then you are playing with, with uh, danger. They have access on their smartphones to things like you wouldn't believe. Now, I've got, a, uh, I've got six grandkids. Three of them are here in our city, and three of them are in the States. So the three that are here are the younger three. I've got an, uh, a nine-year-old, an eight-year-old this week, um, actually, um, sorry, turned eight on Saturday. And then I've got a four-year-old, soon to be five. If I have a problem with my smartphone, guess who solves it for me? The nine and eight-year-olds. The nine-year-old will say to me, Grandpa, give it to me, I'll look after it, I'll fix it. Why? That's what they're exposed to. Now, they don't have their own phones, but most six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds have their own phones now. And they have access to absolutely everything. So their school grades go downhill. Their ability to use their thumbs on their cell phones, their smartphones, goes uphill. They become experts at playing all these games on their phones. Some of the games they play, you don't want them to be near, but who monitors that? Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. So they end up with almost no respect for elders, for seniors, elders, parents. Uh, their obedience level is very, very thin. And they have a do-as-you-please mentality. And, and all their friends are the very same way. It, it's an amazing thing. So... Um, the end result, these kids who are in the early grades, then they are to progress into the more senior grades. We call it secondary school in Ontario. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about. In the States, they, uh, they don't use grade 9, 10, 11, 12 as much as we do. They, they use things like uh, um, frosh, soft, uh, junior, senior. I always have to think, what are they meaning by that? Because we, we hardly use those terms. But here's what I'm getting at. They're adolescents. They're in their teen years. You can't read their writing. You can barely understand what they're saying. And their ability to reason or carry on a conversation is extremely lacking. Um, let's get back to this definition of unloving, just to re fresh your memory. It's a lack of devotion to the family. It's an absence of commitment to the family. It's the breakdown of the family. It's the loss of family affection. Now, that's just the Greek word storge, which is dealing with family relationships and the love that we are to have within the family. Parents for kids, kids for parents, kids for each other, parents for each other, et cetera, et cetera. But when you have so many divorces and so many single parent homes, and uh, you know, a lot of these single parent homes have never been anything but a single parent. It was like, wow, that's not the way we were raised and that's not the way it was when we were kids. 
But I want to just take a moment before we go on to look at the other words in the Greek language, the most common words for the word love in the Greek language. Storge is one of them. There's three others that come to mind. The word is agape. That means the God kind of love. That's the love that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the God kind of love. And then we have filio. That's a brotherly love. Amen. That, that extends past the natural brotherhood, like brothers and sisters. But that's the kind of love you have for a friend. Amen. Uh, longtime friends, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what you, good friendships, deep friendships. That's filial love. And then we have eros, erotic. That's the uh, matrimonial love. That's, a, that, that's, the per, that's the love between a, a man and a woman, the marriage. Now, I'm not talking about stuff outside of the word of God. I'm talking about a, a marriage between a husband and a wife. It's physical love. It's intimacy. Well, uh, would you not say that that particular kind of love has been perverted by television, by movies, by the Internet, et cetera, et cetera? Um, yes, it has. So let me go back for a minute. The word agape is God kind of love. So I call that a vertical love between men and God. Vertical love. The other three, storgos, that's for the family. Filio, that's for friendships. And eros, that's between married partners. Those are all horizontal relationships. They're all horizontal relationships. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, those horizontal relationships have gone way off course. Uh, into areas that are unacceptable to God. Um, unloving. I know it's the word storgos or storge, but the, the implications of that particular word apply to things like eros and filio, and to some extent it also applies to, to uh, agape, not from God's point of view, but from man's point of view. Man says, human beings say, men and women say, I love the Lord. But the scriptures, Jesus says, why do, you, why do you call me Lord when you don't do anything I ask you to do? You don't love me. You love yourself. That's why in this group of perilous events, the very first one is lovers of self, followed by lovers of money. So it's really important for us to understand that this unloving is a very, very strong force to destroy the family, to destroy the family unit. The strength of a nation depends on the strength of the church. And the strength of the church depends on the strength of the family unit. And you know as well as I do that our nations are not as strong as they used to be, especially in the realm of morals and ethics, which means that our churches aren't as strong as they used to be in the form of morals and ethics and spiritual values, obviously. And the family unit is disintegrating and deteriorating. Oh, we could go into a lot of discussion on this, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that things are falling apart in the family. I worked with um, a men's ministry for many years across Canada. Uh, it was, it was uh, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole's ministry, Christian Men's Network. And... Um, we, we uh, were associated with them, as well as uh, providing them a home base in Canada to minister across Canada. And Dr. Cole's ministry was, was primarily focused on manhood, on men. And uh, he wrote numerous books on that. And the point he was getting at all through that was that the strength of the family depends on the strength of, in the, of the man. The Word of God describes a man as the head of the home and uh, it equates both man and woman, the wife and the husband, as equal partners. 
but the ultimate, ultimate responsibility, the one who should take the hits would be the man. Well, so many homes today are single parent run by the, the women, the wives, the former wives, the mothers, et cetera. So things have been really distorted over the last 50 years. Let me close this session with a couple of definitions. And these are definitions I learned from Dr. Cole. The first is a definition of what love is in a very practical sense. I hope this helps you. Love is the desire to give to others at the expense of yourself. A person who operates in love has a desire to give to other people, even if it costs them something. Now, the opposite of that, because that's what we're studying here in unloving, it's the opposite of loving. So the opposite of love, which is the desire to give at the expense of self, could be called unlove, or I'm going to call it lust, as Dr. Cole I would say. And lust is the desire to get from others at their expense. So lust is the desire to take, to get, to, to take away from someone else, and it costs that someone else whatever it is. Love is the desire to give. What is it? We give time, we give ex expertise, we give knowledge, we give our wisdom, uh, we give finances, uh, we give training and teaching, we spend time out of our schedules to help other people. So at the expense itself means I have to give up some time, I have to give up some money, I have to give up some experience, I have to give up some wisdom, I have to mentor someone, I have to teach someone, I have to spend time with someone. This is, dis this is disappearing. Disappearing from our lifestyles. Um, unloving is the desire to do what you want to do. You don't care what it means to other people, what it costs other people. You're going to do what you want to do. And when you look at all these other terms that we've been looking at, boy, they all factor into this. Don't they? They all factor into this. When we were in verse number two, the last points were unthankful and unholy. And uh, that leads to unloving. When you no longer have an attitude of gratitude, or when you no longer have any respect or honor or uh, reverence for uh, alt, uh, al on the Almighty, you're going to become an uh, unloving person who is self-centered and just seeking your own and doing what you want whenever you want to do it. And that's where we're living today in an unloving society. And it's getting worse week in and week out, month in and month out, because we are living in perilous times. The Word of God tells us you're not entitled to know the exact uh, timing of the end, but you will see all kinds of signs. And when you see them and know about them and hear about them, you better look up because your redemption's drawing nigh. We'll be back on Wednesday, and I want to encourage you to go to our website, insightstotheendtimes.com, where we have all of our previous um, podcasts listed. We also have, uh, uh, I think, even a more expanded list of our web uh, podcasts on our victorylondon.com uh, site. And then I want you to also be aware of the fact that we've written a number of books that go along with a lot of our teaching here on the podcast. And those are available to you when you go to our websites. And uh, uh, they can be a great blessing to you, that's for sure. Call you blessed. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for joining us today. Amen.